Next, we have one of our um, home University of Utah students. Uh, he's been working with the Retina Group some, and he's going to, he's Amit Subhash, and he's going to be presenting on autoimmune retinopathy, and here, I'll let you. Thank you, Julia. Um, so my name is Amit Subash, as she mentioned. Um, I would like to point out that Taylor and I did not work together despite our uh, backgrounds being identical. Um, so we're gonna be talking about autoimmune retinopathy today. Uh, we'll start out with uh, what kind of prompted this discussion um, with a, a case, Mr. B, 51 year old male um, who presented actually eventually, uh, initially in 2014 for evaluation of scotoma. Um, at that time, he, he presented stating that he noticed about five months ago um, that he just had this blind spot in the center of his vision of his left eye. Um, it was gradual and onset, and he said it was just gradually harder to read. He described it as a gray circle around the very center of his vision. Um, he stated that color seemed to be duller in the left when compared to the right. Uh, however, his right eye felt to totally normal. At that time, his visual acuity uh, was 2060 in the left, 2020 in the right. His exam was otherwise normal, um, and he was eventually referred to retina um, given his uh, persistent complaints. Um, <coughs> with the retina team, this was later in 2014, um, he had an OCT, uh, autofluorescence, visual field, everything was um, normal. He did have an ER ERG that came back abnormal, was followed up with an FFERG um, that was stated to be abnormal as well. Um, the patient was thought to have a uh, cone rod dystrophy, um, and six months later he, he came back uh, with subjective worsening of his vision. His visual acuity continued to correct to 2020. Um, however, Dr. Bernstein noted um, atypical progressive cone degeneration with the normal fundus. Um, Autoimmune retinopathy popped up on his differential and he happened to uh, send uh, blood work or blood samples uh, to Oregon to OHSU um, to detect the presence of anti-retinal antibodies. So uh, we'll start out with definitionally what is autoimmune um, retinopathy. Uh, it's an inflammatory mediated retinopathy. It's characterized by vision loss, scotomas, um, visual field deficits, photoreceptor dysfunction, and the presence of circulating um, anti-retinal antibodies. Uh, it generally can be broken down into two categories, perineoplastic and non-perineoplastic. Uh, the perineoplastic category can, act can be uh, further broken down into cancer-associated retinopathy, or CAR, and melanoma, oh, that's a typo, melanoma-associated ret retinopathy. Um, this phenomenon was actually first described in 1976 by Sawyer et al. Um, they described vision loss and photoreceptor dysfunction associated with, with cancer. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I focused a little bit more on um, non-perineoplastic um, retinopathy. Um, so just to give you that kind of preface. Uh, as far as epidemiology, um, it's pr the prevalence of the disease is actually currently unknown. Uh, some groups estimate that it constitutes less than 1% of all ocular immunology cases. Um, however, um, as with many things, I think we often find that these estimates are, are under, uh, these, these estimates are, are under, uh, under the true values um, just because we lack the diagnostic capabilities, diagnos diagnostic standards to, to, make, uh, to make the call. Um, and so, Due to that lack of standardization, um, I suspect that the prevalence is, is probably higher. Um, and beyond that, clinical features of disease um, kind of overlap with a lot of other diseases, so it, it's difficult to tease out. Um, like many other autoimmune diseases, uh, there's a predominance of females affected by autoimmune retinopathy. As far as signs and symptoms, um, patients will, will often present with things like subacute vision loss, Scotomas, photopsia, uh, nyctalopia, photoaversion, dyschromatop dyschromatopsia. 
um, visual acuity generally remains good in early stages of the disease. Um, on exam, the fundus is, is generally unremarkable. Um, some literature has, sh has shown that patients can have uh, poor foveal reflex. Um, the disease is usually bilateral, um, but it can be asymmetric. Um, a typical patient presentation would be a woman uh, in her 50s or 60s. No history of visual um, problems prior to onset of photopsia. Um, presence of scotoma and no family history of things like uh, RP. Um, and here, so on the left here, um, this figure just shows um, what I was mentioning previously about a poor foveal reflex. Um, other groups have described uh, <coughs> fundus autofluorescence in, in patients, revealing this sort of outer ring of hyper hyperpigmentation or hyper autofluorescence. And you can clearly see that with, with arrow sign over here. Um, and uh, additionally, um, there's been some, some suggestion that OCTs um, may have loss of inner segment, outer segment, um, loss of the inner segment, outer segment junction um, with preservation of the fovea. And, and once again, that's demonstrated with the arrows here. As far as the pathophysiology, um, so autoimmune retinopathy, it's, it's thought to be triggered by molecular mimicry uh, between tumor antigens and retinal proteins. Um, there's two major antigenic retinal proteins that are currently described, well described in the liter literature, recovering, which is a calcium binding protein in photoreceptor cells, and alpha enolase, um, which is a glycolytic enzyme um, that's present in, in many non-retinal tissues as well as retinal tissues um, that's a, a magnesium binding protein <coughs> and uh, is a transcription factor in, in DNA synthesis and whatnot. Um, it's possible that the non-perineoplastic forms of the disease may also be triggered by a cross-reaction between retinal proteins and uh, presumed viral or bacterial proteins. Um, recovering, although it's most commonly described as being associated with a cancer-associated retinopathy. Um, uh, it can also be present in non-perineoplastic forms of autoimmune retinopathy as well. And alpha enolase has been shown to um, have the same kind of properties as recovering as far as being present in both perineoplastic and non-perineoplastic forms. Um, as far as how to make the diagnosis, uh, there's actually no, as I was mentioning earlier, there's no current gold standard. However, um, uh, a paper in 2014 kind of suggested that we, ha we have these proposed essential four major criteria. No evidence of malignancy after a thorough workup. No evidence of degenerative eye disease such as RP. A positive screen for serum antiretinal antibodies and abnormalities in ERG findings with or without visual field abnormalities. Um, <coughs> some additional supportive cr criteria are just kind of those signs that um, patients or symptoms that patients may, uh, may describe um, things that we, I had already mentioned, photopsia, scotoma, and nyctalopia, et cetera. Um, currently, the only commercial testing is available at OHSU, which is why we had sent um, our patients' uh, blood work to OHSU. Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Shakur have joked on many occasions that we should be receiving some sort of financial compensation for keeping their institution uh, afloat with the number of tests we've been sending to them. Um, as far as treatment, uh, for the perineoplastic uh, autoimmune retinopathy, um, essentially identifying uh, a primary malignancy with CT scans um, and then following that up with whatever the indicated cancer treatment would be, whether it be chemo, radiation, um, et cetera. Um, for non-perineoplastic forms, um, generally speaking, we're looking at uh, immunosuppressive therapies at this point in time. Uh, so systemic or local steroids, IVIG, plasmapheresis. Um, therapy has not been shown to be very useful once widespread uh, retinal degeneration has occurred. And um, there's, some, there's some literature that suggests that cytoreductive surgery um, or just a debulking um, may have some benefit in uh, specifically the mel melanoma-associated melanoma, um, retinopathy. Um, as for our patient, um, he is currently on a, um, so he had CT scans that were performed uh, of his abdomen, chest, everything came back negative. Um, he's presumed to have a, uh, 
I should say that his blood work came back positive. Um, Western blot was positive and um, immunohistochemical staining was positive. Um, with regard to the Western blot um, testing, um, given the nature of looking for bands at specific um, kilodaltons, we know that um, the testing itself is not very specific, but kind of backed up by um, IHC staining. Um, uh, we're pretty confident that the patient uh, does have a non-perineoplastic form of autoimmune retinopathy. Um, and he's been initiated on a, p a prolonged prednisone taper um, that's supposed to be followed up with a uh, CELSEP and later with cyclosporin. Um, so essentially going, going the immunosuppressive route. Um, the current research, uh, current research for autoimmune retinopathy is focused around um, establishing uh, better diagnostic standards. There is uh, some suggestion that eyes with autoimmune retinopathy um, have loss of retinal tissue um, when compared to eyes without um, known ocular pathology, specifically in the RPE. So it's possible that uh, therapeutic options could be, could be targeted towards that in the future. Um, however, uh, one of the biggest challenges at the moment is, is identifying biomarkers for what patients may or may not respond well to, to like, for example, immuno or immunosuppressive reg regimen. Um, and here are my references. That's all I have for you today. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Shakur, um, and any questions? Does not. Do they do not? Around seven hundred dollars. Is that right? Eight fifty. So as far as our patient, I know that we, um, we were looking, it, it's basically whole body CT scans is, from, is, is what I gathered, um, essentially looking for a primary malignancy. Uh, we did, uh, from what I gathered from our, our, our patient, um, it was essentially chest CT, uh, abdomen, pelvis, CT, those all came back negative. Skin, okay. 